Well, welcome everybody um, to our annual press preview. Um, and I'll just start with a very brief opening remarks before and, and to set up the format for what we're going to do. And, and then we'll get started with the cases. And well, actually, we'll get started with something else. But last term uh, was a term of blockbusters, um, most of which fizzled out. This term, by contrast, doesn't have any blockbusters to begin with. Uh, but I think a more accurate caption for this term is the calm before the storm. We are headed for a whole new world, and the only real questions, I think, is how far are we going to go, and how fast are we going to get there? Our format today is as follows. We will start with the discussion of what impact the current nomination will have on the court. And for purposes of this, um, I hope you'll let us all assume that um, the current nominee will be confirmed and not get into questions uh, that may have arisen by virtue of things that occurred over the weekend. After that discussion ends, we'll invite press questions on that topic. Uh, then we will discuss one at a time four cases that have already been granted that we think are potentially the most significant. Um, they'll be presented by one person, and that will be followed by discussion by anyone who wants to add anything that will be followed by press questions on that case, if there are any. Um, then we are going to discuss several cases that the court is likely to grant cert on, but have not yet been granted. These are ones where there are pending petitions, and we'll do two or three or four of those, depending. And then if there's any time left, I'm just going to identify um, some of the significant cases bubbling up in the lower courts and invite panelists to say whatever they want about them. This is really a term in which there are uh, a large number of potential blockbusters um, kicking around in the lower courts for which there are no cert petitions pending. But I'll just mention those at the end. And then anybody who wants to say anything about them may do so. I think everybody here knows our participants. They need no introduction, so I'm not going to give you one. Um, and we will start with, and we, we, we'll be a little out of order, so um, we're going to start with Don, who will present Madison against Alabama. You're starting. Oh, I'm starting. OK. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the broad question. Right, yeah, right, good. Okay. <laughs> My fault. So uh, the first question, of course, is what impact uh, the current nomination is going to have on the future of the court. And anybody can answer that in any way they like. And whoever would like to start with that, um, please, somebody start with it. OK. I'm, I'm just going to pick up on what Irv was already quoted publicly as saying, or, or put a little bit of a different spin on it. Um, if the new justice is Judge Kavanaugh, but quite frankly, even if it's someone else who's on the, the Trump list, I think there are five areas, at least, five important constitutional areas, in which that justice's views will not deviate that much from Justice Kennedy's. That is to say, the general views will be pretty coterminous. But it's likely or at least possible that that justice will be pressing harder and quicker to get to the more sort, sort of to the ends of those views, the extreme positions or, the, or, or, or the, the ramifications of those views in ways that Justice Kennedy would, would sort of pull back on the reins at the last minute and want to, to sort of moderate or not reach difficult questions. And some of them, they're probably obvious to you. So one would be abortion. Next would be affirmative action. Um, third would be presidential power writ large, including the president's control over the executive branch, possibly also war powers questions, but more the internal separation of powers and the president's, the unitary executive questions. Um, religion, and we might talk later about the, the Cross case that's currently on a petition, right? Justice Kennedy's views on that are not very different from Judge Kavanaugh's or some, or someone else's. 
but even in the cro- in the last cross case, the Buono case, right? He he was the writer for a decision that that didn't reach the merits, right? I think he was always happy not to reach the merits in a lot of these issues. And finally, fifth, and perhaps most importantly, and I'm curious what my co-panelists think about this. The thing with the, these all have practical implications, especially affirmative action and abortion. I think have very practical implications. But especially the death penalty and solitary confinement, where Justice Kennedy had signaled, you know, had both voted with the liberals on limiting the death penalty. He wasn't going to go so far as to abolish it with Justices Breyer and Ginsburg, but then made noises about putting serious Eighth Amendment limits on the practice of solitary confinement. And that is a promise or a prospect that I don't that I think is probably now dead, but not for sure. Um, and I think those are very the, the five areas that it seems to me that the new justice won't won't in theory be very different from Justice Kennedy's philosophy, but will be more willing to push harder and faster. So others, different views. Well, I guess I'll, I'll offer a pretty modest comment. I agree with Marty that those are some of the areas that we should be looking at. You know, the kind of the question in my mind is: Is it going to be fast or slow? You know, is this like uh, the new person will come in and be emboldened with this court and think it's time to get some of these things done? You know, I don't like where the Supreme Court is now. Or will it be a more gradual process? You know, I tend to think that it would be a more gradual process just because that's the way that the court itself has tried to decide cases incrementally in the next 10 years and or in the last 10 years. And I think that, you know, also it depends on the personality of the justice. And so, you know, if you're assuming it's someone who's already been a federal judge for a significant period of time, you know, I tend to think that it would be, you know, a person who comes in and kind of respects the role of the other justices and, you know, wants to make a difference, but not a big splash and make friends with them and kind of, I would say, build power gradually, if you will, as opposed to, like, I'm here and it's time to do stuff. And I think, um, depending on what happens with the the rest of the confirmation process, you know, the court might feel kind of battered and like it needs to take things a little bit more slowly. But that's the thing that, you know, I'll be watching to see what happens. Yeah, I'll um, pick up on where uh, Nicole left off. Um, and I'm Canon Shanmugam for Williamson Connolly, and it's a, always a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think that Nicole has identified really the key issue, which is how is the new court, because the court is always a new court when it has a new member, going to approach the subject of stare decisis and to the extent that the new justice has divergent views from uh, Justice Kennedy, you know, how quickly is the court going to move in a different jurisprudential direction? And I think that there are good reasons to believe that the court will move gradually, as is its custom. Um, and I think that that is in part due to the Chief Justice, who I think has demonstrated in his time on the court a real reluctance both to uh, overrule the court's prior precedents and uh, to move quickly. I think the best example of that is uh, Shelby County and the Voting Rights Act, though I think you could say the same thing about uh, uh, the uh, uh, eventual decision to overrule Abood and the court's um, a view of the constitutionality of agency fees as well. These are areas of the law where even if the court ultimately ends up overruling a precedent, it does so uh, incrementally. And I just think that that is the Chief Justice's, uh, that is in the Chief Justice's DNA to kind of move uh, gradually uh, rather than uh, quickly. Um, and however uh, a new member of the court feels about uh, stare decisis, I think that the Chief Justice is is largely going to dictate the terms going forward. Um, I do think that uh, that in in my observation, for what it's worth, I think that new justices, when they get to the Supreme Court, tend to get there. They tend to uh, 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 exhale and to uh, realize that they're going to serve on the court most likely for uh, a very long period of time. And I think that that, in and of itself, uh, often uh, induces a certain degree of, of caution. Not always, I think. Uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, uh, has expressed his views, I think, quite robustly and confidently uh, uh, ever since virtually the day that he arrived at the court. But I think by and large, justices, when they get to the court, are uh, 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 somewhat careful about um, uh, 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 themselves expressing their views in uh, uh, excessively absolute terms. And I suspect that a, a new justice will uh, be in that mold as well. <laughs> 
Anyone else? So, um, you know, this timing issue is kind of an interesting one. I guess this is just because I'm getting old, but uh, um, what the difference between swift and gradual is, you know, if you, you're just taking the examples uh, Canon correctly identified, is, you know, the difference between one year and five years, right, uh, if you think about it. The, the process of overruling a boot started with the Knox case and, you know, there were a few iterations and five years later it was overruled and, and I think but for Justice Scalia's passing probably would have been overruled sooner than that. Um, Shelby County, that was three years after the Northwest Austin case. Um, Citizens United, you know, that the process of overruling Austin, you know, from uh, the uh, right to life case to to uh, Citizens United was three or four years. So um, the, to the extent we're talking about a gradual process, I do think there are a number of markers uh, with respect to uh, many of these justices already in terms of what we're talking about in a timeline. Um, and that would be the kind of timeline I would expect for some of the issues that Marty identified. I don't, I don't know the whole field, but on the question of considering race and public university admissions, we've got cases that are a few years away, I think, from getting to the court. Maybe there's a case that I'm not aware of that's closer. Um, the, the one place I think it's, you know, it's interesting, and I think I have a different view about this than most uh, keen observers, and maybe most everybody else on this panel, is abortion. Um, I, am, I, I share Cannon's view about the approach of the Chief Justice, but you know, the question of what's going to be on the docket isn't always 100% in the control of the justices or even the Chief Justice. And I think, for example, marriage equality, that issue got to the court faster, I think, than most uh, of members of the court would have preferred in the wake of Windsor, but there it was, and you know, eventually they had to do something about it. And I anticipate that that's going to be true about abortion also because while there are some cases that can be handled under the Casey undue burden rubric, there are other cases that really can't. Um, and those are the cases, for example, like the Iowa fetal heartbeat uh, law, uh, which was enacted and is under challenge, I think, in the state courts now. You know, you now it's certainly possible that the State Supreme Court will rule that law unconstitutional under Roe and that the Supreme Court will deny cert. That could happen, certainly. But I think after, you, I think it would, will be likely that you'll see several states enacting laws that in one form or another put to the court the question of whether Roe should be overruled because they won't be about burdens on uh, exercising the decision to have an abortion. There'll be limits on when abortions can occur that aren't consistent with Roe. And, uh, you know, my sense of things is that at some point, maybe in that five-year window, you're going to see a case like that on the court's docket. Um, and, uh, and, and so in, in terms of the pace of change, yeah, you know, gradual, but gradual's, I think, three to five years. Yeah, and I'll just add three quick thoughts. One is if, you know, if you're looking for a good sort of predictor of what the court might look like with a new judge uh, appointed by President Trump and confirmed by the Sen Senate, I mean, I think last term is really the place to look at what the future looks like because you had this kind of unusual dynamic of Justice Kennedy uh, not joining with the four liberal justices in a single 5-4 opinion. And so you ended up having a term where I think the court did indeed sort of punt on a lot of uh, important issues. And I think if they hadn't punted, you might have seen Justice Kennedy joining the four liberal justices. But because of the punts, you know, you do have this remarkable statistic that, you know, given that Justice Kennedy typically joined with his, you know, four more liberal colleagues in about 25 percent of the five, four cases, the number last term was zero. So I, th I think that's a good predictor for w what the future may like and be like in the sense that I do think uh, you, you may have five more predictable votes for relatively conservative outcomes. Um, you know, the second point, and this is complementary of just a different way of maybe of saying what Nicole and Cannon have already said. You know, I think for, for years and years and years, basically as long as I've been following the court, you know, the major way to think about the court is in terms of who's the swing justice. And I'm not sure there will be one. 
um, going forward. And, uh, you know, I, and I think, you know, honestly, what we'll have is not a swing justice, but I think we'll have sort of a governor switch. And I think the chief justice will be the governor switch, which who will determine how quickly the court moves and in what directions they move quickly versus slowly. But I think it would be kind of wrong to think of the chief justice really as a swing vote. I don't think that's the way uh, to think about it. I think it's more a, a regulator of how quickly they're going to go. And on, on that question, my, my third thought is, you know, I do think there are some structural considerations that may also, uh, you know, move towards uh, the court moving a little bit slower than you might otherwise uh, expect. And, you know, I think it's just because, in part, I think it's because you're going to have, at least for another, what, two and a half years, you're going to have a Republican administration in the White House. So some of the issues that you might have in terms of a relatively conservative court interacting with a relatively progressive administration are going to be deferred for a couple of years. I don't see, no matter what happens in November, uh, the the Congress passing a bunch of cutting edge progressive legislation, uh, you know, anytime super soon, maybe I'll be wrong about that. But um, so I think if there are going to be issues that are going to be sort of percolating up to the Supreme Court, it's going to have to be mostly issues that come from uh, blue states um, doing either innovative things or filing innovative lawsuits. And as to doing innovative things, I think that may generate some cases in the shorter term. I think some of the innovative law, I'm the, you know, not probably the right person to make this prediction, but I wonder if some of the innovative lawsuits are going to lose a little bit of steam because, you know, I think if you look at the combination of the ultimate outcome in the travel ban suit and the prospect of a new justice, I think the idea of bringing some, you know, interesting nationwide injunctive suit within the contours of the Ninth Circuit, where you may well win at the first two stages, but then face Supreme Court review, I just think that becomes a little less of a tantalizing prospect, given the outcome in the travel ban suit and the new composition of the court. So I'm just not sure, you know, I, I think there are structural considerations that are going to maybe, you know, make it a little harder to tee up you know, some of these cases. And, you know, Don's right. You're going to have states that are going to pass laws that presumably are going to be invalidated by courts applying existing precedents. But that's a dynamic where the court really can control um, whether they want to take the case that, you know, may well be right under existing precedent and would only be wrong if they want to overrule something. That really is a situation where the court can decide whether or not it wants to take the case. Anybody else want to uh, respond to anything anybody else has said? Feel free to do so. Press questions. Yeah. Don left me hanging. Uh, so if they take it in the next five years, do they overturn Roe? That again, I'm. I realize I'm in a distinct minority in, in this point of view, but my uh, my expectation would be yes, um, at least in part. Um, and the reason for that is because I think these are highly principled people. And, it, and Roe is incompatible with um, the, their most uh, deeply held views about how you ought to understand and interpret the Constitution. And that's been true for many decades. And I think if the issue is before them and they have to make a choice, that that's what they will choose to do. How do you overturn it in part? Well, uh, like a fetal heartbeat law would still allow for abortions in the first several weeks in advance of a, uh, detecting the fetal heartbeat. Um, and so, but it would uh, categorically preclude abortions in the period after detection of the fetal heartbeat, which would be within the period in which Roe would presumptively allow you to have an abortion. Anybody else on want to comment on the specific subject of what they see the abortion? So I, I you know, I kind of want to just leave the panel and give up on life hearing that from Don, but I guess that's probably not an option. So instead, I'll say this, which is, you know, Don is right there. I, I do some work for Planned Parenthood, so I have some insight into where this might be going. And there are a, a significant number of red states that are passing laws that are 
that seem like they are just flatly unconstitutional under Casey and under existing under Whole Women's Health. And they just think they're teeing it up for Supreme Court review. And there are a lot of them. There's been some stuff happening in the Eighth Circuit, some stuff in the Eleventh Circuit. And like that is coming. And they're not they're not incremental, you know, laws. They're like asking for the whole enchilada. And so I certainly hope that that's not a future that we find ourselves in. But, you know, certainly I think we're right to be worried about it. Others on abortion? So question. Fine. Well, so I'll jump in. I just think, so we're coming up on the long conference, right? The Supreme Court's got lots of te cases teed up and has to decide what they're going to grant review in around the end of this month. And they have some things, you know, they've got circuit splits and some are on business topics and some are on religion and, you know, some are on other pot button issues. And the question is, you know, are they going to look at that list and say, bring it on, I want to take all the hot button issue cases, or are they going to say, uh, you know, maybe we'll take the Establishment Clause case and we'll take some business cases and kind of make it more moderate. You know, I, it's hard for me to predict because you have to put yourself like in the mind of the justices. But, you know, you imagine you're getting a new colleague and it's been a pretty, you know, hard fought, difficult process and that they might see some of these cases, even if there's a circuit split and even if it's a really interesting issue and just think we can wait. You know, sometimes they can't wait like the situations Don talked about, but most of the time they can. Yeah, I think um, oh, I was just going to add one thing, um, which is that, you know, I think it's been really striking the extent to which justices from across the um, jurisprudential spectrum have, uh, during this confirmation process, expressed their concern about the confirmation process more generally, um, have expressed their regret at the fact that the confirmation process is not what it once was, and um, you know, none of them has gone so far as to describe the confirmation process as an intergalactic freak show, as I understand one of the members of the Judiciary Committee did yesterday. But I think that they, you know, I think all have a sense that um, the confirmation process has deteriorated. Now, it's I think anyone's guess as to whether that will translate into the court wanting to have some breathing space after the confirmation of a new justice. Um, that didn't really happen after the confirmation of Justice Gorsuch last year. It looked as if the court was going to have a blockbuster term last year, and the court certainly didn't seem to be shying away from taking big cases last year. And as um, Don rightly points out, the court's hand is often forced in terms of the shape of the docket. The court does not always have complete discretion and practice to decide which cases it hears. If federal statutes are declared uh, unconstitutional or if a case comes up, as is the case with regard to gerrymandering on the court's mandatory uh, docket, uh, the court doesn't have always have the ability to say, we're going to wait and we're going to go slow. But I wouldn't be surprised if the court, you know, at least wants to have a little bit of breathing space after the conclusion of this confirmation process. So I, I just want to um, weigh in a little on Don's thoughts. Um, it's not that I violently disagree with them, but um, it seems to me if you look back at marriage, there, there was one court after another holding there was a right to marry um, and no cert grant. And why was that? I mean. Sure, Justice Kennedy um, didn't vote to grant cert, presumably, but I also think the Chief Justice did not vote to grant cert in those cases. Why? Um, maybe it's because he predicted an outcome that he didn't like, but it's also possible that he would have preferred not for the court not to have to decide that at all. I think a big strain in his thinking is he is the Chief Justice of a court, and there is a risk that if we see one 5-4 decision after another with Democrats on the four and Republicans appointed on the five, the country at large will no longer view the Supreme Court in the same way it does now. And I think he's 
He has mentioned this on more than one occasion, and I think he fear this is a f an outcome that he fears almost more than any other. And so I predict that this, the Chief Justice will be trying to move things slowly by not granting cert, even in heartbeat cases. And as I, I can't remember if Don or Paul said, um, there still could be four to grant. And so for me, the key question then becomes here whether the new justice is going to be susceptible to the chief's influence at all um, on whether to keep some of these hot, hot button issues away from the court. Um, as I've said, I think the, the kind of undue burden cases where Justice Kennedy would have found an undue burden, those are fair game now. Um, you know, all the, to the extent people want to bring them, they're going to find out there is no undue burden on things that maybe people thought there was. Um, but on the on the straight up question, I, I'm still thinking that uh, we're years away. Well, you may be right about that, of course. Um, and I, I'm loath to disagree with you and your predictive powers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I guess when I look at the future and if it's one or two states who pass laws like this, maybe, but you know, if it's six or seven or eight states and they all get struck down, and I don't know, I think at some point the pressure for the court to uh, take one of those, ca those cases is going to just be enormous. I, I do think, I tend to agree with Irv, but I do think, you know, over the course of three to five years, as Don was saying, it's going to look like there are a whole bunch of these five to four cases that break down on what the public will view as partisan lines, including many that involve elections and 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 that affect how partisan elections are decided. And so I wonder also, in addition to Irv's good point that the chief will try to be use the cert process to slow things down, whether he'll also be looking for substantive areas in which there can be um, so, some agreement. And I think he's found one in the Fourth Amendment where the, where the where it doesn't break down just on on partisan lines, including Justice Gorsuch, who has a very odd but potentially rich. Um, opinion in, in Carpenter, there might be more than five, or we don't know what the new justice will think about that. And I suspect the chief will be looking for other areas like that, that show more um, crossing of the typical partisan divide. I don't know what they would be, though. I, I don't think they'll be the five major areas that I identified some, at the outset. Some, for, but some free speech cases, not all, but some. Some free speech cases in the sense that there will be some issues on which the democratically appointed justices will be in favor of the free speech claim, but on the whole range of economic free speech um, right. cases, I think those will be the most heated, among the most heated five fours of the next five to ten years. <laughs> well, you you know you're, you're, you've at least hypothetically eliminated one possible explanation, which is just you know the the petitions were poorly written. Um, you know, I I, I I think that that is an illustration of the phenomenon that was you know kind of unmistakable in the Second Amendment context, but was present in lots of other contexts where if you have a dynamic where the court is. 414 and the one is giving neither set of four any particular indication that they're with them you know you got to have then a real incentive to want to roll the dice and i don't think in the second amendment context there was much of an incentive because the left side of the court was getting substantive outcomes that weren't that bad from their perspective and the right side of the court you know, didn't want to put the whole enterprise at risk by teeing up, you know, the issue again. So I, I think that sort of explains what was going on. So does that change now? I think it, it, it may well change now. Um, but again, to Irv's point, you know, the you didn't need people to really follow the Chief Justice's lead to enforce a dynamic where when it's 414, even though you have four votes to grant cert, 
it doesn't make much sense tactically to vote to grant cert. But when you have a world where you think the chief is probably with you at the end of the day, he just doesn't want to do it today. I don't think you have the same kind of self-enforcing constraint on the four to not vote to grant a case when they think the result below is wrong and will likely be reversed by five justices at the end of the day. So I think that's why Irv's absolutely right that in order to allow the chief to go slow, you have to have you know, one or more members of the court willing to sort of follow his lead on how quickly it is appropriate to take on some of these issues. I also wonder how many of the justices really are bothered by the status quo when it comes to gun, gun laws. I mean, I think Heller and McDonald did the work that they wanted it to do, which is to basically stop the sort of acceleration of gun control laws and put a stop in the political process on that. And they're probably fairly happy with the way things are. It had the political and practical um, legislative effect that it was supposed to. And, and I don't see in their opinions or elsewhere them really chomping at this bit, bad example, um, to, to go further in that way. But, but I might be wrong about that. So, I mean, I, I guess the next issue is carry, right, Paul, or not? Oh, there's lots of Besides, issues. No, and, and, and that's the thing. Like, they could, they could, if they wanted to, they could tackle a relatively big issue like right to carry. But there are also enough sort of petitions working their way through um, that involve, you know, relatively discrete issues where, you know, I think it might be tempting for the court to kind of remind people that we're still in this game, but not take on like a big controversy, you know, a, a seriously controversial issue, but take on an issue that's, you know, a little more sort of um, limited in sort of its scope. I mean, you know, I have a petition that we filed that involves a New York law that basically says that you get a premises permit and that means you can't even take your handgun essentially you know, to your, to your summer home or to a target range in New Jersey, but that you, you basically can only possess your handgun inside the premises of your home or on the way to and fro a New York City uh, target range. Now, it seems like a law where you know, it's not going to be the, the like blockbuster material, but on the other hand, they could sort of say, all right, look, you know, we're not... It's not anything goes on the Second Amendment now. You know, this is an example of a law that you know barely passes rationality test, and we're going to strike. We're, we're going to strike it down. I, I, I think an issue like that might be something that would be attractive to the court, just as a way to get back into the game, but sort of dip their toe in the water instead of taking on carry, which is the next big issue. Okay. Other questions here on the. Well, I, look, I'll start that. I mean, I, you know, Cannon managed to get all of his cert, you know, petitions granted last term, which was really clever. Um, you know, for some of the rest of us who have a couple of petitions, you know, in the long conference, um, you know, we've all done the math, and four out of eight is harder than four out of nine. And so, you know, I do think that, you know, if 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 the court is, you know, we we saw this very recently, if the court gets down to eight justices. It's going to slow down the the pace of grants, and you know maybe maybe some people think that's a good thing, um, but Supreme Court practitioners don't. <laughs> you know, or they can just that's which ones. Or they can just take the less controversial cases. I mean, they feel. I think that there is a real pressure at the court this time of the year. Like, okay, we need to fill our calendar. Like, maybe we don't need to take the same number of cases as last year, but we have sittings in January, February, March, April. Like, we need to have cases to hear during those sittings. And it's at the point where you know there's some January time that's full, but not all of it. And if you map out the schedule, you know, they really need to grant cert now so that it's not an extremely accelerated briefing schedule, right? You barely are going to get the regular briefing schedule if they grant at the end of the month. So, you know, there's going to be grants. They just might pass on some of the um, more high profile stuff. Yeah, I would just add, I, I, I agree with Nicole that I think it may affect 
which cases the court grants rather than how many. You know, we have seen this sort of gradual depression in the number of cases that the court is hearing. I think last term there were uh, decisions in only 59 argued cases, and that is a noticeable decline even from the days of hearing 75 or 80, which were not so long ago. I do think that we have, you know, some indicator of how the court operates with eight justices from the, the period in, in 2016 and 2017 when that was the case, and I think that the court seemed to just be taking different cases. The court took a lot of patent cases. It took a lot of cases that I think ex ante, the court probably felt confident that it could resolve by a clear margin. I think the other very practical effect is on the cases that are actually being argued. Uh, you know, I'm representing uh, the petitioners in two cases that are set for oral argument in November. And it's a very real consequence when you're sitting there thinking, boy, to get a reversal, I have to get five out of eight rather than five out of nine. And that's true even in cases that don't have much of a political valence. And so, you know, if the court has a period of time when it's hearing oral arguments in cases when it has only eight justices, that will be the dynamic. I don't think that there are a lot of politically contentious cases on the court's early docket, and uh, you know that will be borne out by what we discuss for the rest of the morning. Uh, but um, uh, uh, if and when the court has those cases, of course, then the question is going to be, can the court uh, uh, address those cases in a narrow fashion uh, uh, when those cases might otherwise be heading for a, a four to four tie, which it is clear from the most recent period is something that the court really doesn't like to do. Why don't we uh, move on to the cases that have been granted and uh, now, Don. You still want me to go first? Yeah. Okay. Go. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a case, Madison uh, versus Alabama, which uh, is a death penalty case. And it's a case that's uh, pretty circumscribed, both in terms of the facts and the relevant precedent. Uh, the, uh, the defendant in the case, uh, uh, was convicted of murdering a police officer in 1985, sentenced to death, and has been on death row basically since then. Um, and over the course of these many decades, um, he has developed a condition uh, called vascular dementia. Um, and as a result of that, apparently he is unable to remember the facts of surrounding the crime for which he was convicted and scheduled to be executed. The Supreme Court uh, several decades ago decided a case called Ford against Rain Wainwright, which uh, essentially established a, an Eighth Amendment standard, invoking both the Eighth Amendment idea of evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a civilized society, and also common law norms from the time of the founding that people who are uh, incompetent should not be executed because they cannot understand why they are being executed and therefore uh, the retributive purpose of inflicting the punishment uh, can't be vindicated in that circumstance uh, and then the I think the older common law idea was also based on some notion that a person before being executed ought to be able to understand that that can happen so the person can make his peace with God before being executed. And uh, there was another case, uh, Panetti, some decades later, in which the court reinforced this principle. And this case is a, a case essentially about the scope of that principle. Uh, uh, Mr. Madison's lawyers have argued that because he can't remember the facts uh, that uh, uh, led to his conviction, he is in a position comparable to those who were found previously to be incompetent to be executed because they can't understand the reason why they're being executed. Now, the difference here that makes this an interesting uh, case jurisprudentially is that he hasn't been found incompetent to understand the logic of the situation, i.e., that he... Um, did in fact commit this crime decades earlier. He's going to be executed because he committed that crime decades earlier. He just can't remember the facts of the crime. And so the, the central question in the case is whether that principle of Ford against Wainwright applies in that circumstance. Uh, the petitioner, uh, Madison, makes the argument that uh, 
Well, of course it should apply because the notion that uh, the retributive purpose of punishment can't be fulfilled in that circumstance applies equally to a person who cannot remember the facts uh, that uh, gave rise to the conviction, the actions that he took that put him on death row. Um, the state uh, argues that, well, no, um, in a situation in which a defendant can rationally understand the connection between the, the acts that he was convicted of committing and the carrying out of the punishment that that defendant's in a categorically different position and that the deterrent value of capital punishment can still be effectuated by executing this person and that you know, unlike some of the other diagnoses of incompetence, a diagnosis of being ineligible for the death penalty by virtue of dementia will open the door to many more claims on the part of capital defendants, particularly given the fact that we live in this world in which most people on death row are going to die of old age and not be executed, uh, and therefore that there will be some uh, significant number of these cases. You know, this is a case that I think had Justice Kennedy been on the court, you could see this case um, uh, unfolding in a manner, not guaranteed, but but I think probably likely unfolding in a manner that, uh, in, in, unfolding in Madison's direction uh, in that it's a case in which I, I think Justice Kennedy's instincts would have been appealed to by the nature of the arguments being made here. And uh, it, although it could create uh, some additional subset of defendants on death row who uh, would have claims uh, to try to defeat their execution, um, in the great scheme of things, it's not going to involve any s significant structural change to the way capital punishment is being carried out. I, I just think it's going to be a very different proposition with the new court, however. Um, and uh, this is a case I think is scheduled to be argued the first Monday in October. So, um, it, it, you, know, that's, that, you know, that's another uh, significant consideration, I guess, whether this initial argument will be before an eight or a nine justice court. Um, Anyway, so that's the and, case. And, and a four four affirmance would mean he's executed, he's executed right? right? Anybody else have a thought on this one? I, I just wonder, you know, I was thinking or mentioning before, are there areas where there might be some movement? It's not obvious to me why the four conservative justices or five, why none of them is, is amenable to much movement on the Eighth Amendment issues. Um, it appears that way. It doesn't seem, there hasn't been any sign through amenable, but I'm not sure what the political constituency is for that or the jurisprudential priors are for that. It's not a, I don't think it's a big issue in sort of federalist society circles. And I wonder whether it's a possible area one day, maybe I'm just being too hopeful, where one or more of the conservatives are willing to have some movement there. I don't have any real insight into it. I'm just curious why that has Well, you, you might start with the fact that Justice Scalia wrote a dissent that says there is no such thing as evolving standards under our right. Constitution. I'm just one, I'm, but I'm surprised there are five who think that necessarily. Okay. Well, of course, this, this case, I, you know, whether you're right or wrong about that, Marty, I don't think this is a case where you're likely to see that kind of movement because this is a case where I think the action is likely to migrate from the substance of the claim to the process arguments yep. that the state of Alabama is advancing that, you know, this can, you know, one of the things that tends to lead conservative justices not to support the claims of people on death row is when they seem to be sand in the gears type claims yep. to conservatives that you're Major. trying to make the process of carrying out a, a, a lawful and valid execution uh, difficult or impossible by generating additional claims which have got a factual basis and therefore have to be adjudicated and I think that that, whereas I think that this would have been a case with Justice Kennedy that was more anchored in the substance of the Eighth Amendment law, I think those procedural kinds of issues are going to take uh, center stage. Yeah, my only comment is, you know, if, if I were a Supreme Court reporter, one of the things that would kind of intrigue me is trying to figure out when the other justices got wind of the idea that Justice Kennedy was retiring last term. And I think this case is prima facie evidence that they didn't know as of February 26th, which was the date this case was granted. Because I don't think granting this case 
if you're a liberal justice, makes a lot of sense if you know that Justice Kennedy is not going to be around to decide it. So would it, would it have been one of those where it's a cert denied and two or three of them dissent from denial? Maybe, you know, but, but you know, again. He is going to be executed that way. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you, but I, I yeah. you know, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe death is different in that respect, and they, they, they'd grant it, you know, just to, to forestall things, but, but I don't know. I mean, it's well, hard to hard to think that if you're one of those justices that you think granting this case on February 26th, if you know Justice Kennedy's not going to be around to decide it, it's going to make Eighth Amendment law better, not worse, from your perspective. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yep, totally. Questions? All right, Cannon. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about um, Gundy versus United States, which I think is going to be argued on the next day. It's going to be argued on October the 2nd, which is two weeks from tomorrow. Um, this is a, a very interesting case. It involves the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, those of us with multiple children think of the non-delegation doctrine as the principle that an older child shall not delegate household tasks to any of his younger siblings, but this is the legal version of the non-delegation doctrine, which is a, a bedrock principle, the fundamental pr principle being that Congress uh, should not delegate uh, legislative authority to the executive branch. Um, this is a principle that the Supreme Court has long articulated but rarely applied to invalidate congressional action. It has been invoked uh, episodically since the New Deal, but never with the court uh, invalidating a congressional enactment. Um, the principle as the Supreme Court has articulated it is that Congress in enacting legislation can of course afford broad discretion to administrative agencies to implement its enactments, but it has to articulate in the words of the court an intelligible principle for the exercise of discretion. And I think it is uh, fair to say that there is uh, uncertainty about what uh, exactly uh, that means. In this case, may shed some light on it. Um, the non-delegation principle uh, is, is one that is often invoked in traditional administrative law context, but it comes to the Supreme Court in this case in uh, a somewhat unusual context, in the context of um, uh, the criminal law, and in particular a challenge to a statute known as SORNA, the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. Um, the statute was passed in the 2000s. Various issues concerning the interpretation of the statute have come to the Supreme Court previously. I think it's fair to say that even by the standards of Congress, this was not a terribly elegantly drafted statute, and it has all sorts of uh, uh, ambiguities and issues. But the issue that is presented in this case is simply the question of whether Congress contravened the non-delegation doctrine when it passed this statute. As the name suggests, this is a statute concerning sex offender uh, registration. Its provisions are relatively intricate, but I think I can express uh, Congress's uh, primary goals relatively simply. Um, first, Congress wanted to establish certain minimum standards for uh, sex offender registration. Sex offender registration, as you might expect, is an issue that is uh, uh, handled primarily on um, the state level, but there were some variations in the standards adopted by the various states, and Congress sought to address those uh, in SORNA. Um, second, um, Congress uh, uh, sought to require uh, uh, sex offenders to, among other things, report uh, their interstate travel um, to state authorities, and it imposed criminal offenses for uh, offenders who traveled uh, interstate and failed to uh, report their travels uh, to state authorities, invoking Congress's power under uh, the Commerce Clause. And um, third, and most relevant here, uh, Congress um, uh, permitted the Attorney General to specify the applicability of the reporting requirements, uh, and that's the phrase in the statute, specify the applicability of the reporting requirements to uh, sex offenders who were convicted before SORNA was enacted. And at least if you believe the secondary sources, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million sex offenders who fall into that category as to whom SORNA is being applied retroactively and the question um, then becomes, uh, uh, you know, how, how is that going to work? And in the wake of the enactment of SORNA, uh, uh, the Attorney General 
uh, promulgated regulations, um, somewhat unusually, these are actually Department of Justice regulations that basically made the reporting requirements applicable to all uh, pre-SORNA sex offenders, though there's been some variation uh, over the years about uh, exactly how that's going to operate and uh, whether uh, pre-SORNA sex offenders get credit for certain amounts of time served and the like. Those details are really not of great uh, significance. So the petitioner in this case is an individual by the name of Herman Gundy. He was uh, uh, convicted of sex offenses prior to uh, the enactment of SORNA, and he was eventually convicted of failing to report uh, interstate uh, travel. So this is an individual who sort of falls into this category of persons as to whom uh, SORNA is being applied retroactively, and he is challenging his conviction on non-delegation grounds. And his argument is a pretty straightforward one. It is that Congress, when it um, uh, delegated, in his view, to the Attorney General the authority to determine which pre-SORNA sex offenders should be subject to uh, uh, its substantive requirements, failed to comply with the intelligible principle requirement because it simply afforded the Attorney General unfettered discretion to make the determination about which pre-SORNA sex offenders qualify. Now, the government's response to this is that uh, SORNA, in fact, did offer such an intelligible principle. In its view, uh, SORNA uh, gave the Attorney General the authority and the directive, in its view, to, uh, in the government's own words, and I'm quoting from its brief, to achieve coverage of pre-SORNA offenders to the maximum extent feasible. And so the government's view is that embedded in this principle that delegates authority to specify the applicability of SORNA's reporting requirements is this directive that just says, look, we want you to cover these pre-SORNA sex offenders, uh, again, to the extent feasible. Um, petitioner's response, not surprisingly, is that that's nowhere to be found uh, in the language of the statute, that the statute, again, constitutes uh, an unfettered delegation of discretion. Now, um, notably, um, at, at least three members of the court, two of whom are still serving, have previously expressed concern about the scope of the delegation in this provision. Um, Justice Scalia wrote a, um, a separate opinion in one of the court's earlier cases involving the interpretation of SORNA expressing concern about this delegation. He was joined notably by Justice Ginsburg in that opinion. And then Judge Gorsuch, when he was serving on the Tenth Circuit, um, expressed uh, a very similar concern about SORNA um, in, I, I believe, a dissent from the denial of en banc review in one of these cases uh, in the Tenth Circuit. And I think in light of uh, those separate opinions, I think there is a very high likelihood that uh, the court will, in fact, apply the non-delegation doctrine here. There are all sorts of interesting questions about the scope of that doctrine, whether the court might um, seek to put um, a greater degree of teeth into the intelligible principle uh, 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 standard. Uh, Justice Thomas has suggested uh, in one of his kind of characteristic separate opinions that the court, in fact, should do so. But I, for one, am pretty skeptical that, that this is going to be the vehicle for the court to do that. I think that this is just about the worst case that the government could have um, for attempting to defend a statute against a non-delegation challenge. Um, not only is the statute by its terms quite broad, but this arises in uh, the criminal uh, context, or at least in the context of a statute that has criminal consequences, including for the petitioner here. And it arises in a case that has an overlay of both retroactivity and federalism uh, concerns. And these are the contexts in which uh, the court tends to be at its most uh, sympathetic to challengers. And so I suspect that what we're going to get out of this decision, particularly if it comes from an eight justice rather than a nine justice court, is a decision that applies a non-delegation doctrine but says comparatively little about the scope of that doctrine. I would just add one other thing, which is that what is interesting about this case is this is one of those classic cases where the non-delegation doctrine has been, you know, I think something of a cause in the conservative legal community, but yet you have the Trump administration and the Trump uh, administration's Solicitor General's office 
uh, defending uh, this statute. Um, Jeff Wall, the principal deputy solicitor general, is listed on the brief, even though this is technically a criminal case. I wouldn't at all be surprised to see uh, Jeff argue this case in uh, a couple of weeks. But I have to say that in reading the government's brief, my reaction was that the government uh, uh, took one look at this case and is hoping uh, simply to lose it narrowly. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments on that? I guess I have one comment slash, you know, question for the panel, which is, you know, to me, there are perhaps difficult cases about the non-delegation doctrine, like you need to have an intelligible principle. And so when Congress tells the EPA to, you know, set regulations and gives them like some general guidance, is it good enough? But, you know, this is a case with criminal consequences. And it seems like the implication of the government winning would be that the attorney general could define things as crimes himself, kind of without Congress. And it I can't imagine that that is something the Supreme Court would accept. And I wonder if that's really a narrower way to decide this. I think that it's been, this case has been briefed, that that's kind of been briefed as a, a separate issue, as, you know, an easier way. And so I'd be curious to see what folks think. And just, you know, maybe one data point, I, during the time I was in the SG's office, we would occasionally see cases in the lower courts where the government would have a case, would have um, like an immigration case where it would have, or a, a, a statute that would have immigration consequences and also criminal consequences. And issues would arise about deference, like Chevron deference. Could you get Chevron deference to the immigration deference, you know, opinion that the Bureau of uh, the BIA has when it also has criminal consequences? And, you know, at least my view at the time was like, oh, how could we seek deference? We're not supposed to be defining what crimes are. Well, here the AG is actually defining what a crime is. It's not even a question of deference. So I just have a hard time believing the government will get very far in this one at all. Yeah, I mean, I think, Nicole, the government concedes in its brief, you know, that very hypothetical. I mean, there's a line in the government's brief that says, if SORNA, in fact, authorized the executive to create new federal crimes out of whole cloth, that would raise substantial constitutional questions about non-delegation under any standard. And for those of you who are not adept at translating SG speak, substantial constitutional questions, I think is going to mean we wouldn't defend that. We would definitely lose. Um, but I think the real problem for the SG's office in this case is, you know, how do you go about distinguishing this, this provision from a provision that does exactly that? I mean, I just really think that if, you know, uh, Congress said to uh, uh, the, the Justice Department, if, if Congress passed a law that said, you know, it is for you to define uh, what constitutes a federal drug offense. I mean, I don't know that the Supreme Court would even bother to hold oral argument. They would say. Well, Congress has accessible. actually done that. You know, <laughs> the, you, the government, uh, the AG schedules drugs. That the AG does schedule drugs, but I think it's fair to say that Congress has provided a somewhat greater degree of specificity in, in 841 or whatever the provision is. So one strange thing about this is that this would be so easy for Congress to fix. And the question is, which way does that cut with the justices? So the SG comes up with an intelligible principle to the maximum extent feasible. If that were in the statute, the government would win. And if the court holds that this is unconstitutional because it's only implied and not expressed, it'll take Congress, even this Congress, only a day or two to put that in the statute. And the question is whether, if, the, if that's all they're doing is sort of teeing up to Congress this, this easy sort of housekeeping task, will the left side of the court be nervous or anxious about opening up the non-delegation doctrine, which as one scholar has quipped, has had one good day in American history, right? There was a single day in 1936, I think 36 or 35, when the court invalidated two statutes on non-delegation days. And every other day, it's been a bad day for the non-delegation doctrine. Well, do they want a second bad day where this does have all this ideological and practical valence for other issues and statutes, or do, will they just see this as being one of those areas where, yeah, we can get a 9-0 because you, know, you can't say nothing um, and you have to be expressed. If the, sta if the standard's gonna be the maximum extent feasible, just throw that in the statute. And it's an easy one for some consensus among the justices. I don't have a good sense of whether that makes it an easier or a hard case, the fact that it would be so easy for Congress to fix. So I, you know, I'm, I'm going to take this in a little bit different direction, but I think this is going to be a significant, potentially significant case because it's connected up with the whole idea of Chevron deference and how courts are going to interact with uh, the executive branch, administrative agencies, and particularly their interpretations uh, of ambiguous federal statutes uh, in that, 
and and then Judge Gorsuch in his you know now famous uh, concurring opinion in the Gutierrez case in the Tenth Circuit identified this. You know, Justice Scalia's critique of the idea that courts should make the judgment about the meaning of a statute uh, that's ambiguous that an administrative agency is administering is that, well, as between government bureaucrats and judges, at least the government bureaucrats are connected to a system that's held politically accountable and judges aren't. Um, and, you know, to my mind, that's always been a pretty strong defense of the idea of Chevron deference or some kind of deference anyway to agency interpretations of ambiguous statutes. One answer to that is, well, uh, we can fix that problem. We just need to reinvigorate the non-delegation doctrine. And that's exactly what then Judge Gorsuch said in that opinion. And um, this case being such an egregious example, I think, of, uh, of concern about non-delegation does seem to me to actually be an opinion, a, a case that could generate some opinions that are going to have importance as that other set of issues starts to play out. Yeah, and I would pick up on the last thing that Don said, which is this is a case where I would watch the separate writing, because I do think we're going to get a majority opinion that's probably pretty narrow, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, if we get substantial separate writing that really explores the contours of the doctrine. So just to add uh, the potential significance of this, the entire administrative state depends on a non-delegation doctrine that has no teeth in it at all. Um, the court has said you can say to an agency, do what the public interest requires. And that's an intelligible principle. And there are many delegations of authority that may not be that general and vague, but are not all that specific either. And I do think there are some justices on the court who see a real problem with this, uh, including Justice Thomas, but also um, Justice Gorsuch. And um, I do think the justice to come is also somebody um, who might feel similarly about these kinds of broad delegations. So I, I agree with, um, I guess, both Marty and Cannon here, which is that we'll we're apt to see a very narrow opinion that just says this gives no guidance at all. But I do think we are going to see some separate writings that start to um, question the wisdom of the court's previous decisions, saying that intelligible principles is all that is required, and that there are you know people saying there are some decisions, as Justice Thomas has already said, where I don't care if there's an intelligible principle or not. This is something Congress could, should be doing because it has the power to legislate, not the exam and can't delegate that. And um, so, and it is related also to Don's point about Chevron because I think a lot of them feel the same way about Chevron, that there are, maybe there's some role for these kind of minor technical decisions to be made by administrative agencies, but big issues of major policy should be uh, for the court. So Give, Given that, Irv, and the fact that the chief knows that there's going to be that difference of opinions, it, it'll be interesting to watch his assignment in this case, whether he gives it to someone on the left side of the court who will write a narrow opinion and then welcome the, the broad concurrences, or to one of those who would write a a broad opinion and then ask the, the liberals to sort of say this was all unnecessary to the decision. Anyone else? Press? Questions? Anyone? <coughs> all right, then uh, we have now two decision, two cases uh, of the three in which a party is asking the court to overrule one or more of its precedents. Uh, there are three cases coming up that, uh, in this term where that's true, and I, I think these are two of them, and I, they may be just as important for what they are going to tell us about the new court's um, approach to stare decisis as they are for uh, their own significance, which they are significance in their own right. But we'll start with Nicole, who has Gamble. I love this case. So this is a double jeopardy clause case, and I'll, I'll start from the beginning. So the Fifth Amendment has a, a protection that you're not supposed to be twice put in jeopardy for the same offense. And the language of the statute says same offense. And so there, there was some, a period of time in the Supreme Court where they had to consider questions like, what does it mean to be put in jeopardy? What constitutes the same offense? How do you define them? And those questions pretty much all got answered. And things were quiet for a while. 
And then there was a case uh, a few years ago, uh, Puerto Rico versus Sanchez Valle, which was one of the first in a long time to raise what's called the separate sovereign exception to double jeopardy. I'm very interested in that case because I argued it and the government won, and Don was involved. So it was a great time for all of us. Um, <laughs> and so that One of case, the few cases you won that term, right, Don? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and so that case was really interesting because there, there has been in U.S. law a longstanding exception that even if something is the two offenses are the same offense, like the same elements arising out of the same conduct that the person did, that you could be prosecuted twice for them if they were by a state government and by the federal government. This is the separate sovereign's exception. And the idea behind it was you really, they're really not the same offense because they're offenses against different sovereigns. You offended the state and you offended the federal government and you can be prosecuted for both. Now, I have to say parenthetically, this, this did not arise a lot because, as probably everyone in the room knows, there are many, many federal and state criminal laws, and it's often not that difficult to find an offense that is a little bit different from the state offense or the federal offense that's already been prosecuted. You just find one that has a different element, and then you're good to go, and you don't even have to worry about this double jeopardy question. But this longstanding precedent said, state, federal government, go ahead. So Puerto Rico, which has had many issues relating to its status as a U.S. territory and what that means and um, various historical events, said, uh, we, we're going to take advantage of the separate sovereign doctrine, too. Like a state can do it, so we can do it, and so we're going to. And so that raised a very interesting constitutional question about does Puerto Rico have the same status as a state for purposes of this uh, separate sovereign's exception under the Double Jeopardy Clause? And the Supreme Court, after much briefing and many interesting arguments um, said, no, Puerto Rico, you're a territory. You're not a state. You don't get to take advantage of this. You know, if we just look at it as a constitutional matter, you don't get to take advantage of this separate sovereign exception. But there was an amicus brief filed in that case. I think it was by like the Florida Bar Department. I mean, I read it carefully. I don't know how many other people did, um, at least two, as it turns out. And so uh, that decision said, look, this separate sovereign idea is terrible. And it turns out that we took this idea, this double jeopardy protection from England, and England wasn't following anything like this separate sovereign's idea. And so it's been in U.S. law for a long time, but like you should get rid of it because there's really no basis for it at all. And so it didn't really come up, you know, in the, the main briefs at oral ar or at oral argument, but some justices were paying attention. And Justice Ginsburg wrote a concurring opinion in this Puerto Rico case, Puerto Rico versus Sanchez Valle, joined by Justice Thomas. So kind of an interesting pairing you don't see every day, and said, I think we need to reconsider this, and gave some reasons why perhaps it did not make sense to have this separate sovereign exception so that a person could be prosecuted twice. You know, among them, like, you're supposed to, the double jeopardy clause is supposed to be protecting you from, you know, being harassed by being prosecuted many times and protect your liberty, and it's just not really doing that if you can be prosecuted for the exact same thing by the state and the federal government. So a couple years passed. Somewhat unsurprisingly, a large number of criminal defendants made arguments based on uh, the idea of overruling these decisions that allowed the separate sovereign exception. Um, and a number of cert petitions got stacked up. We probably saw them, and they were many of them were held for many, many conferences. I think this case that was granted, Gamble, was relisted, I don't know, seven, eight times, like a lot of times. But the Supreme Court decided to take the issue. And so now it has this case that tees up this legal, this purely legal question in Gamble versus the United States, which is, should the separate sovereign doctrine be overruled? So I'll start with the government's position, which is no. And they, they basically have, I would say, two arguments. Argument one is the separate sovereign's uh, exception is required by, makes sense in light of, something like that, our dual structure. So we are in a unique position here that there is a territory, the territory of the United States has two sovereigns operating within that same territory, the states and the federal government, and they both have the power to prosecute. And if you don't have, don't give them both the ability to prosecute, the state could do things to intrude on the federal government and vice versa. So like what if a state um, went to prosecute a civil rights offense and just gave the person, or, you know, didn't, didn't prosecute them for much of anything or got them a really lenient sentence or something like that, the federal government would be barred from prosecuting and, you know, vice versa. And so that to the extent that there is, you know, a really meaty legal argument on the government side of things, it is one based on the structure of, you know, our constitutional structure, dual sovereignty, and the powers that both state and federal governments have. Um, the second argument is really stare decisis based. And the government hit that argument hard in its brief in opposition to cert. 
One tends to think that it might not matter as much now that the Supreme Court has granted review. Government hasn't filed its brief yet. And so there the Supreme Court said, or the government said, you know, we've had 150 years of precedent that has recognized a separate sovereign's exception and things are working fine. And essentially we should stick with it. So, you know, not bad arguments. But then you get to, you know, the other side, the criminal defendant side, which has, I would say, a lot more arguments. You know, argument one is the, the purposes behind the double jeopardy clause. This is about individual liberty, and a person is not supposed to be able to be harassed by, you know, two governments operating in the same place that, that would prosecute you for the same offense, and we need some protection against that. You know, argument two, the one I alluded to before, um, historically, that, the, that if you look at what was happening in England at the time, it's not just that there wasn't this doctrine, but that to the extent that courts had considered it there, they had rejected it. And so I think there are examples in the briefs about if you were prosecuted in England versus prosecuted in Wales, could you, know, could you be prosecuted in both for the same offense? And the answer in England was no. I should say on the government side, they would say, um, yeah, that's fine. I don't care what happened in England because it wasn't the same situation that we have with, a, with two sovereigns operating in the same territory. Those were situations of separate territories. Other arguments, um, the, the defendant re responds to the government's you know, really big legal argument by saying, I can't believe that you're saying that the, the dual, you know, that dual sovereignty is something that's going to cause me to be, you know, twice prosecuted because it's supposed to protect individual liberty. Like the whole point in terms of what the Supreme Court has said about having dual sovereigns, splitting the atom of sovereignty is to protect individual liberty. It's a big idea of Justice Kennedy's. So how can you use it to, you know, essentially keep me in jail longer, harass me, prosecute, you tw prosecute me twice? That's terrible. And then, you know, two other arguments. One is there have been other cases which, you know, those criminal law nerds in the audience might know about where uh, the Supreme Court has previously considered, like, if a state got evidence in violation of the Constitution, could they just give it to the federal government? This was the silver, silver platter doctrine, which has existed for a while. And the answer under Supreme Court precedent is like, no, you can't just have the state get the evidence in violation of the Constitution and give it to you. There was also cases about um, whether this, like, the state or federal government got evidence that was compelled in violation of the Fifth Amendment, then could the other one use it? And that answer is no. So if you think about, like, kind of unifying Fifth Amendment law and trying to get it all, like, relatively consistent, Consistent, that seems to be, you know, cutting in favor of getting rid of the dual sovereignty doctrine. And then, you know, the last question, which I think is going to be the most interesting when we see the government's brief, which I don't think has been filed yet, which is the real practical implications of it. Like the government definitely in its brief says we have this, you know, sovereign power and we should be able to exercise it and exercise it and the state shouldn't be able to intrude on it and we have to respect them, you know, so it's vice versa. But if you think about the times when, you know, there is an, an offense, there's something bad that someone does, if you, if you can't find two different statutes to prosecute it under in light of just the number of, you know, criminal <laughs> statutes out there, I mean, there are very few instances, I think, in which that was true. And actually, the government used that argument in its um, brief in opposition to search, try to get cert denied. So we'll see how much it comes back to bite them. But, you know, I would expect there'd be a lot of questions about, um, you know, I see that you're unhappy with this government, the idea of getting rid of this extensive precedent, but is it really going to hurt you at all? So my prediction is that the government is in trouble and that the Vic Gamble is going to win. Although, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what bothers individual justices and how they line up, especially in light of the Ginsburg plus uh, Thomas concurrence from a few years ago. Other comments? Um, I mean, I'll just jump in. I mean, I agree with Nicole. I think this is a very interesting case. I also agree that the government is in deep, deep trouble. Um, just, you know, I, I think from the perspective of the importance of this, I mean, you know, Nicole's point that there's always something that the federal government could find that's not the same offense for Blockburger purposes, and therefore maybe this isn't a big practical deal. I think there's some truth to that, but I also think that there's the opposite way of looking at it, you know, I think may appeal to the right side of the court, which is, you know, in a world where, you know, 18 USC was really narrow and really focused on distinctly federal crimes, like this doctrine shouldn't matter at all because if all the federal government is doing is pr prosecuting crimes with a very distinct federal nexus, there really shouldn't be any overlap. And I think there's a broadly shared view on the Supreme Court um, that's certainly, I think, a view that's accepted on the right side of the court, but was really, uh, you know, embraced in Justice Kagan's dissenting opinion in the Sarbane-Oxley fish case. Um, about the overfederalization now of crime. And so if, if, if you're a justice who tends to think that Congress has been overfederalizing crime 
and in particular passing st federal criminal statutes, not because there's some super distinct federal element to the crime, but just because, hey, it's relatively easy to do, uh, it's relatively popular, you're tough on crime, um, you know, prospective criminal defendants either don't self-identify or don't have good lobbyists. So it's just a really easy thing for Congress to do. So 18 U.S.C. in a world where it goes from this to this, this becomes a way, I think, for some of the justices to strike a little bit of a blow against the over-federalization of crime by saying, look, if, if you're prosecuting a federal crime that's just the same, has the same elements as a state crime, the, the two sovereigns just get one shot at it. And then just the other thing to amplify, um, you know, I'm going to talk about one of the other cases where the court has a possibility of overturning uh, one of its prior precedents. I think this case is important because I think the two other cases that are lined up for the court to revisit cases on stare decisis grounds are likely to be 5-4 votes and are probably likely to be five justices that are more conservative that would at least be the most tempted to overrule precedent. And so this is a case where I think it will be kind of important if this is not a 5-4 decision. I think because of what Justice Ginsburg has already said, there's a real good chance it'll be 6-3. There's a chance it could be 9-0. Um, and I do think you know, it will be important to the chief, let's say, to try to make this a case where it doesn't become the third of three cases where stare decisis considerations are overridden by the five conservative justices over the dissent of the four more liberal justices. You know, I, I thought one of the most interesting votes that was cast last term was Justice Ginsburg's vote in the Wayfair case because she was the only liberal justice that voted to overrule uh, the Quill case. And, you know, I had this suspicion that if, that, you know, if you were one of the liberal justices, like, why vote to overrule Quill? Because who really cares that much about Quill and who really wants to pay more taxes on their internet purchases? And why would you, why would you vote to overrule a decision when there are other cases, like the case involving whether to overrule a bood, where you really want to bang the stare decisis drum? And, and I think there's kind of another dynamic like that here, which is, you know, I do think I don't think of, as an a priori matter, I don't know why the left side of the court wouldn't think overruling the separate sovereign's doctrine is a good idea, but I think the only thing that may sort of uh, kind of put any limits on their thinking about that is, you know, they may be worried about what stare decisis means much more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if this is a case that's really going to implicate kind of how stare decisis operates because, you know, the practical reality, as Nicole says is that, you know, I think that uh, the ab ability to prosecute twice for effectively the same offense has become something of an insurance policy for prosecutors. I mean, I think particularly in high profile cases, what often happens is that the federal government goes first, secure in the knowledge that if something goes wrong, for whatever reason, there can be an ensuing state prosecution. You know, I don't think that the availability of that insurance policy uh, implicates a lot of the reliance interests that serve uh, 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 to undergird the uh, uh, principle of stare decisis. It's kind of hard for prosecutors to say that they have a legitimate interest in uh, having that opportunity for a do-over available. And as Paul says, you know, in, in many of these cases, uh, the federal hook is just a, a, a convenience for what is effectively a duplicative prosecution. So I don't know that there's going to be a lot of sympathy for the federal government in this case. And I thought that Petitioner, uh, in his brief, I think it's a he, did a um, very good job of um, arguing that this separate so sovereign's doctrine kind of came out of whole cloth and that there isn't really a very good jurisprudential underpinning for it. Anybody else? Press questions? Yeah. Well, given though, despite the concern about how over federalization of crime, given though that there are, you can almost always find some federal statute that's different with some elements in the state crime, what practical uh, difference is it going to make? And, and I think actually it's just the opposite in civil rights cases. They let the state go first with the feds as a backup in case the state botches the case, with the exception of the church shooting. But, uh, so what difference is it going to make as a practical matter when there are, you can almost always find some federal statute 
I don't think, it, especially based on you know my government experience, that it's going to make all that much difference as a practical matter. And I think that's because of two factors. One, there's actually a, a fairly long-standing policy that's referred to in the briefs about how the federal government will decide um, whether to bring a suit after the state does, and that and that it basically counsels in favor of caution and a real consideration as to what the federal suit's going to add. And so that policy, I think, has been around since 1960. But just second, you know, I, I imagine that what the government is doing right now in preparing their merits brief is actually trying to come up with instances of, like, statutes where you can't bring both a federal and state prosecution for some reason, you, that there wouldn't be another state statute for some certain offenses. And I, you know, I'm kind of generally aware of a few instances in which that's true because it was something we considered a few years ago. But, and there are a lot of statutes, so I imagine they'll come up with a list, but I can't really imagine that it's going to be, you know, a lot that would make a difference, you know, in a real difference in terms of criminal prosecutions. And can I just ask a follow-up? Clearly this case is about offense, which is in terms of how the, the conduct is defined for technical purposes. But is there any thinking in this case that you shouldn't be charged twice for the same conduct? That's not this case. Yeah. That might be the next case. I mean, which is to say, you know, I, I do think there are some areas where this will make a, more of a practical difference. I mean, I haven't, you know, had, you know, I did an amicus brief in this case, but I didn't study it from the government's perspective the way that Nicole did. But, you know, controlled substances, areas like that, you know, I, I do think there are areas where the elements of the federal offense really aren't that different from the state offense. So I think there's some areas where it will make a practical difference. But I also think that if the court recognizes the doctrine overrules the separate so sovereign's doctrine, it will over time potentially put a little more pressure on the Blockburger test, which is the test that says that you know it's not the same offense as long as there's essentially different elements to each offense. And I think you know certainly there's there's you know if if, if this ball gets rolling a little bit, and this could be one of the areas that you know Irv alluded to, where you might get you know sort of both you know, some, some conservative justices and some liberal justices who are a little more excited about sort of double jeopardy principles. And, you know, you could over time sort of erode Blockburger or expand it and have something that makes it a little bit harder for sovereigns to prosecute twice for the same kind of common nucleus of operative fact or whatever you think of in the civil context. Uh, one peripheral thing about the case not involving the double jeopardy clause itself that I found notable. Um, the Solicitor General, Noel Francisco, has up to this point been recusing himself from any cases in which Jones Day is the counsel, as they are in this case. And I just noticed that he did in this case, too, at least at the cert stage, um, which might be interesting just because Jones Day, I think, continues to be the counsel to the Trump campaign. And therefore, it's an interesting question whether Noel would recuse himself if he were ever asked to become the acting attorney general or deputy attorney general for issues involving the, the Mueller investigation, for instance. A true sidelight. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have one last thought about um, double jeopardy, which is, you know, this case, I think, is is potentially attractive to the court to, to try to bring people together for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's well in the vein of what has happened, especially in criminal law, of kind of bring, bringing existing law into some kind of coherence and harmony, in, especially with historical practice, and kind of making sure that things make sense. You know, in my view, a lot of the court's Fourth Amendment jurisprudence is like, do we think this makes sense? Do we not? And I think that there's this, you know, I expect a decision in this case, you know, will be the court thinking that it's really trying to make sense out of a doctrine that didn't make sense and have it be consistent with historical practice. And, you know, the other thing, and I think this is what Irv and perhaps Paul said, you know, it just has the potential to be like an easy win for the court, you know, a way to get people to agree. And on a case where it would be like rights protective to individuals, which, you know, those are good decisions to, to offer once in a while. And so, you know, I would, I would think that this would be that kind of case. So I think the two people to watch here will be uh, Kagan and Breyer. Um, I think up until now they've uh, had a pretty much no never view and I I will predict that they will stick there but we will see never on what sorry decides oh yeah yeah <laughs>
Um, but not because so, they love duplicative prosecution. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So you know, maybe I could be wrong about this, but I, you know, that when I brought when I brought introduced this subject, I said we'll learn something about stare decisis, and I think one of the things I'm learning is nobody really thinks that there is a stare decisis constraint. Now, you know, if you think the decision is wrong, um, a majority of the court is going to overrule it. At least period. In constitutional. And decision. so, um, and in, uh, in constitutional cases, okay, and so. Um, that's one of the things I think that I, I, the questions to be raised. There's always all these, uh, you know, pagans of virtue thrown out to stare decisis. Does but does it mean anything at all, uh, other than you know you march through these factors that the court has announced about when it's appropriate to overrule its case? And guess what? The first and most important factor is you, if you think the decision was wrong, and if you do, you march through the other factors and you know overrule it. But we shall see. Um, we yeah. have one more along these lines, which Paul has. And uh, just to say that Paul had this case the first time and um, was looking for an overrule and uh, had an eighth justice court uh, and so couldn't. So, Right. But I also had a backup plan, um, which <laughs> That's was, true. turned out to be prudent. And, uh, <laughs> and it's why it's back at the court. Um, you know, just, just on, uh, on the broader point about stare decisis, um, you know, and, and I think Nicole was saying this. I don't, you know, I don't know if her mic was hot or not. But um, you know, I do think the one sort of caveat I would put on that is I do think that where stare decisis matters the least is when it's a constitutional issue where you don't have the reliance interests of individuals. And so I think some of the stare decisis cases that people care most about are those where the court has previously recognized an individual right or an individual liberty interest. And I think the cases where it's hardest for the party that's trying to rely on the older precedent and not get it overruled are cases like Gamble, where the only you know sort of reliance interest is owned by the government um, and the issue is kind of more structural. And I think the court is just more sort of tempted in those kind of areas to think, look, we sort of got to get the constitution's constitutional structure right. And it kind of matters whether the two sovereigns can both kind of you know, prosecute the exact same crime. That's a pretty big structural consideration. And if we've gotten that wrong, we should probably get it right. And I think the same kind of principles apply in the case that I'm going to talk about, um, which is the Hyatt case, where it's a structural state sovereignty issue. And I also think the, you know, just as a bonus sort of tip of the hat, the third case, at least that I'm aware of, where there's a stare decisis issue teed up is this case about whether a takings plaintiff has to exhaust all of their remedies before they can bring their takings case under this uh, Williamson County case. And that's another one where you know the reliance interests are on the government side of the ledger, and the party seeking to get the case overruled has the individual right that they're trying to vindicate. So I think maybe that's a way of saying the Supreme Court could overrule all three of these cases and still not tell you a lot about how they're going to approach a case when there's a really strong reliance interest on the part of somebody who's trying to vindicate their individual liberty interests. Um, the, the Hyatt case, you know, that sometimes people talk in the Supreme Court about repeaters, cases that get to uh, the Supreme Court twice. This is now going to be a three-peater. Um, and I'm not sure how many times that's happened uh, in the history of the Supreme Court. Um, you know, when, when my sons ask me, you know, has this ever happened in, in, in baseball? I always tell them, well, they've been playing baseball a long time, so chances are, yes, this has happened before. <laughs> so I imagine we've had like a three-peater before in the Supreme Court, certainly like in the original docket. But in a non-original case, to have the same case go up to the Supreme Court three times is pretty unusual. Uh, the, the, the case here, the issue here that's teed up for the Supreme Court is whether or not states have sovereign immunity when they are sued in the state courts of other states i.e. their sister sovereigns. So in this case, uh, the California Franchise Tax Board, which is part of the state of California, got sued for damages in the state courts of Nevada. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Supreme Court precedent that is at risk here is a case where Nevada got sued in the state courts of California. Uh, 
So you might think turnabout's fair play, and let's not even look at this case. But you know, like I said, it's the third time they've looked at it, so they're very interested in it. Um, the last time that it went to the Supreme Court, so Hyatt two, uh, was when I was uh, not conflicted, so I was involved in the case. And uh, at that point, you know, there were really two issues teed up for the Supreme Court. One was whether to overrule Nevada against Hall, which is the early 80s precedent that said there was no state sovereign immunity when a state is sued in the state courts of one of its sister sovereigns. And the other question was, well, at a bare minimum, doesn't Nevada have to afford California the same limits on immunity that Nevada has essentially set up for Nevada state government entities, which principally was a 50,000 damages cap. So Nevada basically waived its sovereign immunity for suits against Nevada state entities, but put a cap on damages of $50,000. And so this case was argued to nine justices. Um, I will confess I felt pretty good walking out of court that day yeah. um, because one of the very first questions out of the box was a question from Justice Kennedy that seemed to think that you know he was interested in overruling Nevada against Hall. Um, I felt pretty good about having four other votes. Um, and then, you know, February 13th and the untimely death of Justice Scalia came and the court, having argued this case to nine justices, the court that decided it had eight justices and they decided essentially and, and were expressed in the opinion that they were divided four to four on the question of, over, of whether to overrule Nevada against Hall. That's why we were very glad we had a backup plan, which was this argument that at least Nevada had to give California the same limits on liability that they gave their own entities, and that was decided 6-2 in California's favor, so it was sent back to the Nevada courts essentially to apply those principles. On remand, the Nevada courts did faithfully apply those principles, and the damages for the California Franchise Tax Board were limited to $100,000 because there were two claims for $50,000 each. And so at that point, you know, the grave threat to the California Treasury from a $100,000 suit was, you know, was, 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 was pretty limited. But the court still was interested in taking this case a third time on the specific issue of whether to overrule Nevada against Hall. So, you know, here's a case where if the court had just eight justices, they almost certainly would have passed on this issue because... We like literally already know that the eight justices that are on the court right now are evenly divided. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they took this court, this case, they took it at the very end of the term. Um, so at least Justice Kennedy probably knew um, that he was leaving. But nonetheless, he thought they'd tee this back up for the justices when they returned. So it's a case where, you know, I, I think really the only interesting question is whether there'll be a ninth justice to hear it. And it's not scheduled for argument yet. So I do think it's a case that if they wanted to, they could not schedule for argument um, until they had a ninth justice. And then I think if there is a uh, ninth justice, um, I think that there will be a lot of attention paid to that justice at the argument. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I think the case will, will you know, I. I it's always possible that somebody's vote could change the second time around, but I think the uh, the arguments were pretty well ventilated the first time around, so I anticipate uh, that this will all come down to the new justice. I would anticipate, frankly, that whoever that new justice is, as long as it's appointed by the current president or vice president, uh, they're probably going to be inclined to think that Nevada against Hall was wrongly decided. Anybody else on this one? Anything from the press? You know, it's the, the, this doesn't happen every day, um, so this isn't like you know something where the practical implications are absolutely huge. But you know, certainly, and and you know, and 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 in a sense, I think some of the practical limitations were diffused by the earlier ruling. And you know, but I think you know, with, certainly without the earlier ruling. And, and in this case, the original jury award was for half a billion dollars. And, and you can see why there's a, there's a problem here, right? Because, you know, it, you know, the reason state sovereign immunity it exists in the first place is to protect the Treasury. You might think that when a jury made up of Californians, like, you know, has a dim perception that 
the award they're going to give against the state is ultimately going to be paid by taxes that they may be paying. That might put a little bit of a governor switch on what they're doing. And then you can think about sort of the incentives for a Nevada jury that gets the taxing authority of California in their sights um, and can essentially just, you know, start filling out numbers. So, so I do think there is a practical importance to putting some check on it. I think given that the court already put a check on it in Hyatt 2, I, I tend to think this is probably, you know, about getting state sovereign immunity law, which is something that some of the conservative justices care very deeply about, right. So I think it probably at this point is more about principle than about practicalities. All right, so, yeah. Yeah, though, I, th I think that that's, you know, that's sort of a different issue. That's probably like the post-Wayfair sort of, you know, round of litigation, which, I, you know, I, d I do think is making its way back to the Supreme Court. It'll probably take a couple of years. But, you know, those cases, you know, tend to get litigated in the state courts of the taxing sovereign. You know, maybe there's a little bit of problem with that, which is why there must be some, like, due process limit on the extent to which a state can start taxing uh, out-of-state entities with very little connection to the state. Um, but here, the question is really, you know, when the, when the state itself gets sued by a private citizen in the state courts of another state, is there some state sovereign principle? The 11th Amendment certainly doesn't apply on its own terms, but is there some broader principle consistent with the 11th Amendment that protects the states in that situation? So I want to move on to the cases where there are petitions pending and where some likelihood of grant uh, that seem the most important. We'll start with Marty, who has sexual orientation in Title VII. Um, so I'm going to speak fairly briefly so we can get to a couple of other cases um, as well that haven't been granted yet that might have more of a prospect of being heard on their merits this term. For reasons I'll discuss at the very end here, I don't know whether this question um, is one that the court will, will address this term, but if it doesn't, it probably will next term. So the question, as most of you probably know, is whether um, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of particular characteristics, um, applies to an employer who discriminates against someone on the basis of sexual orientation on the theory that such discrimination is, in the words of the statute, because of sex. Um, and this has been percolating in the lower courts for many years, as many of you know. And it has come up in the context of sexual orientation in two cases, two petitions currently pending before the court, and in the context of transgender employees in a third case. The two sexual orientation cases have been briefed up the, the, the briefing was completed with an eye toward the long conference, but the court itself put off the long conference indefinite, put off the consideration of these two cases indefinitely without explanation recently. And the lawyers in the third case, the transgender case, just wrote a letter to the court urging the court to hear the three cases together. And as I'll discuss in a, in a couple of minutes, I think that's what, probably what the court has in mind, to consider the three petitions together, something that it might not do for several months because the SG might be asked for uh, a series of continuances in the transgender case. So the two sexual orientation cases, one comes up from the Second Circuit, the other from the Eleventh Circuit. They ruled opposite one another. One, the, the Second Circuit ruled that discrimination against um, a, a gay man in that case was discrimination on the basis of sex that was covered, whereas um, discrimination against a gay man in the 11th, the 11th Circuit held was not covered by the statute. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail unless there are a lot of questions about the different theories um, which are well vetted in the Second Circuit opinions and a series of opinions by the judges on the Second Circuit and other courts of appeals. There's several different theories of why this is discrimination on the basis of sex. They all, in the end, I think, sort of come down to the idea that 
if the sex of the employee, whether the employee is male or female, is a but-for cause of their treatment at the hands of the employer, would they have been treated the same way if everything else were held equal except their sex? That is, that is a clear um, instance of when discrimination is because of the sex. If I, if I were a woman and all the other facts were the same, I would not have lost my job. That's the theory underlying all the different legal arguments in the case. And there are two basic responses by employers on the other side, or two, two themes that are pressed hardest by the employers on the other side. One is that really um, what's going on here is not, you shouldn't think of it as a but-for test, the because of standard, but more in terms of what was motivating the employer and the, and the employers here are not being motivated by the fact that the employee was a, was a man or a woman, but instead because they were gay. And in particular, the idea that we would have treated someone of the opposite sex who was also gay in the same way. So it's sort of the equal opportunity discrimination question that the court has never really resolved. An employer that would say, no, I'm going to treat men and women equally bad if they are sleeping with or attracted to someone of the same sex. Yes, this employee happened to be a man, but if it were a woman who was attracted to a woman, would have treated her the same way. And the court's never really dealt with that, and that in one way of, and one argument is that Title VII was not meant to get it that situation, right? That, that, that if the employer um, is, is equally stereotyping both employees on the basis of sex roles, or here really doesn't care about or purports not to care about whether they're one sex or the other, but is sort of getting at something different, which is same-sex attraction or same-sex marriage or same-sex involvement, that that's simply not what Congress had in mind. And that gets to the second sort of argument, which you've all heard, which is that not only didn't the 1964 Congress think that it was covering these sorts of cases, but it would have been inconceivable to virtually any legislature at the time. What's more, the issue of whether Title VII should be amended to expressly cover sexual orientation or transgender, I'll get to the transgender in a second, discrimination has been the subject of repeated efforts in Congress under ENDA, uh, in particular in recent years, and Congress has declined to amend Title VII to more clearly and expressly cover these sorts of cases. Those are the basic arguments. There are vehicle problems with at least the Second Circuit case in that well, one interesting thing about both cases um, is that in both cases, the employer does not claim that it really wants to be able to discriminate against employees on the basis of their sexual orientation. Both cases are at an early stage of the litigation where the employers say, we didn't do it for that reason. We had the legal right to do it for that reason, but that wasn't the reason we did it, and in fact, we don't discriminate against gays and lesbians, and we wouldn't do so, right? We, when we go, if we ever have to go to trial, we're going to argue that it was based on something else. In the Second Circuit case, one twist in the Eleventh Circuit case is that it's a public employer as well. It's, it's Clayton County, Georgia, so conceivably covered by the Equal Protection Clause, although not a claim brought in that case. In the Second Circuit case, the employer, a skydiving operation, actually um, closed up shop. It, 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 it no longer, this corporation no longer exists. It was bought out by another company. And there's an unresolved question about we don't know what the terms of that agreement were or whether the new company has, has now taken on the, li the possible legal liabilities of the old company. So it's not clear whether the old, the, the old company, who is the respondent in the case, or the petitioner in the case, has any stake here other than ideological or their lawyers want to appear in the Supreme Court. It's also the case, if I might say, that the briefing in both of these cases leaves a lot to be desired. None of my fellow wonderful Supreme Court advocates here from, you know, repeat players in the Supreme Court, three repeat players, or in Paul's case, I don't know what 87 would, what the word would be for it. The, the Supreme Court bar is not well represented in the, in the cert papers um, in either case. And although the Second Circuit case has a vehicle problem, the, the, the bottom side brief there for Zarda is by far the best written and best constructed of the briefs in either case. It's possible that there is some good Supreme Court advocates lurking beneath that case. 
And so if the court grants the 11th Circuit case, for instance, which has less, fewer vehicle problems, it might want to grant both cases. It might want to wait till there's a case with better briefing all around. But in particular, I think the court made this move of its own to put off the consideration of the petitions because of the third case coming out of the Sixth Circuit, which really is sort of a clearer case of it's involving a transgender employee in a funeral home, where the funeral home director, who was engaged in the gradual process of transitioning to be a woman, and wanted to present herself as a woman in the workplace and in her other social settings as a prelude to the to to getting sex sex um, change surgery for at least a year, which is typically um, e either recommended or required by, by physicians, and so wanted to present as a woman in this funeral home. The employee was otherwise a wonderful employee for many years, and the employer fires her with the implication that she could have kept her job if she would continue to present as a man. And the theory behind it is, we're a funeral home, right? We're not, you're supposed to be unobtrusive. It, we're, I'm not firing you because I have anything against transgender people, although he does have a religious objection to that as well, but more for the purposes of not getting the customers riled up. These are people in a time of grief. They shouldn't be thinking about things, about whether you're a transgender employee or not. Maybe they have moral objections. Maybe they're just made uneasy by it. We'd like you not to not to basically um, roil the waters in your job here. You're supposed to, you know, not draw attention to yourself. And if you present as a woman, you will. And so it is really a case, at least in theory, in which the funeral home would probably treat transgender persons of, of both sexes the same way. It really is an equal opportunity case and might in that sense be either an easier or at least a more a, you know, more concrete case, context in which the court could deal with the equal opportunity discrimination. Is that discrimination, the equal opportunity sex stereotyping case? The interesting thing about that case is that the EEOC is the respondent, is one of the respondents, the ACLU is representing the employee. But the EEOC actually brought the case against the funeral home at a time when the Obama administration EEOC thought that this had concluded this was indeed discrimination on the basis of sex. The SG has asked for the first extension, and here's the catch. The EEOC does not have independent litigating authority in the Supreme Court. The SG controls the EEOC's representation in the Supreme Court. The EEOC right now only has three of its five commissioners in place, and two of those are Democrats, including former Georgetown professor Chai Feldblum, and so this is a case in which the, S the Trump administration's view on the scope of Title VII, which appears to be different from the Obama administration's view, might be in tension with the way the current agency's view, and the current agency might be unwilling to file a brief in the Supreme Court saying our view is that this is not covered when, it's, when the view of two of the three commissioners is that it is covered. Now, what happens in that case when the SG and the agency are at odds about a legal question? Well, traditionally, one thing that has happened occasionally in cases like Buckley versus Vallejo and some affirmative action cases is the SG will allow the agency to file a second brief. They'll be dueling federal government briefs. I have a feeling this the administration is not going to go that route, not only because it it's in favor of a unitary executive and doesn't really want to be presenting two conflicting briefs to the Supreme Court, but because it figures that when it gets a majority on the EEOC, the EEOC will agree with the Solicitor General on the statutory question here. So what's the holdup? The holdup is that there's three spots, I'm sorry, there's three spots. There's three, two spots open, but three nominations, including Commissioner Feldblum, getting another term, because the Congress provided that there have to be a certain number of Republicans, a certain number of Democrats. It's th always three and two. And so the Trump administration has sent up a package of three nominations, two Republicans and Chai Feldblum, to go through quick confirmation in the Senate. Something you can do if you package them together, but under Senate rules, you can't do when there's individual nominations. Mike Lee, son of Solicitor General Rex Lee, is apparently objecting and putting a hold on this package deal because he doesn't believe the Trump administration should allow a Democrat such as Chai Feldblum to be on the EEOC. 
And therefore, there's a struggle within the Republican caucus of the Senate about when and whether to take these three nominations up. I think the fact of this petition might actually light a fire under the Senate to get these nominations confirmed, at which point presumably the majority of the EEOC and the SG would be on the same page and would be arguing, I guess, for a, um, for a reversal, for a summary, summary reversal. But now that the employee is also a respondent in the case, um, it's the sort of thing the court could take. So I expect that it might take several months for the Senate to confirm these EEOC commissioners, and if it does, um, it might be not until after January when the court grants all three petitions or some combination of them, um, in which case this, these issues would be resolved next term rather than this term. All right. Anybody else on sexual orientation in Title VII, the panel? Any questions from the press? Yeah. It's a uh, Harris Funeral Home out of the Sixth Circuit. Versus EEOC. Versus EEOC. Zarda and Bostock are the two uh, sexual orientation cases out of the Second and Eleventh, respectively. So I have one more case to summarize if uh, we're getting near the end here. Um, and then I'll just bring up a couple of other cases in case anybody wants to comment uh, just by name. So this is Maryland National Park and Planning Commission versus the American Humanist Association. Um, in 1925, the American Legion built a memorial in Bladensburg, Maryland to honor 49 soldiers from Prince George's County who died in World War I. The memorial is in a shape of a cross. Maryland acquired the monument in 61 and funds and maintains it today. The Fourth Circuit held that the main maintenance of the cross violated the Establishment Clause because even though Maryland attained the, obtained the monument to honor fallen soldiers, its principal effect was to endorse Christianity. The Lat Latin cross, the court said, serves not simply as a generic symbol of death, but rather a Christian symbol of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, Maryland has petitioned for certiorari, asserting this is an easy case in which the person purpose and effect is primarily to honor veterans, not to endorse Christianity, and I'm pretty sure the court will see it that way too. Uh, the interesting question is whether the court will take this opportunity to refine its Establishment Clause doctrine as applied to religious symbols. I doubt that a majority of the court is happy with the doctrine, but it's unclear whether they will see this as the case to do anything about it. Uh, anybody else on the panel who wants to comment on? I, I would just add that in addition to the questions Irv raised about whether there's five justices who would coalesce around new establishment clause doctrine when it comes to the symbols cases, memorial and symbols cases, some of the amici in the, at, at the cert stage have said to the court, oh, by the way, you also have to decide in the first instance whether the objecting observers which are all present in all these cases have Article Three standings to Article Three standing to sue, which the court has always assumed in a whole series of cases that it's decided over the course of the last forty years. It's decided a lot of these cases on the merits on the basis of objecting observers, someone who goes by the crash or the memorial of the Ten Commandments all the time and is offended by the established alleged establishment clause violation. And so, presumably, the court will have to address if it takes the case, which we expect it will probably will address the Article Three question, it being a jurisdictional question. And a holding that there's no Article Three standing would actually have a much greater practical impact than any merits decision in the case, although it would get fewer headlines from you folks, unless you decide to explain to your readers that that's actually a much bigger deal, because it would mean this whole series of cases would stay out of courts and would be resolved by political branches where the objectors would obviously always lose. Um, so that was going to be my question for you, Marty, is if the objecting observers don't have standing, who does? It's not clear that anyone would. Hmm. And, I mean, you can imagine cases, weird facts, fact, factual settings in which there might be a plaintiff, but there will be a hell of a lot fewer of these cases if they hold that there's no standing. Hmm. Anyone else on this? I mean, it just, um, Bob, it's a question, but I'll just, I'll, you know, I will just say, and this I think echoes what, what Irv was saying, is, you know, I, I think this is a case where the challengers would have been in trouble if Justice Kennedy stayed on the court. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the interesting question is how much deeper trouble they're in 
um, you know, with, with, with his replacement on, on the court. Um, and I, I, I will just try to contextualize this by saying, you know, there are a lot of cross displays out there across the country. And, um, you know, this is one of the tougher ones to challenge just given its history. I mean, there's a story to be told about, you know, the religious motivations of the people that put the sort of drive together to, to, to put this memorial together. But, you know, this clearly was a war memorial. And there are other crosses that are out there that are not war memorials, have different purposes for their erection. And I just think, you know, I, the, you know from the challenger's perspective, you know, I, I get that this is a very ideological objection, so maybe they're not picking their battles tactically. But this was a tough one to, to, to a tough battle to fight because so of the history Paul's, of this. So Paul's right that there are other crosses out there, some of which are memorials. Most of them are reflecting the particular religion of, for instance, at Arlington, of the person who the cross is there for. And so when it's a Jewish veteran, there's a star. And when it's Muslim, there's a crescent. Or, um, Paul, does point, making, Paul does point to two in Arlington Cemetery in his very fine amicus brief that are more standalone memorials. and and. And one interesting question, Paul might know the answer to this, but I didn't see it in the record, is whether the 49 Prince George's County veterans who were killed in World War I were all Christian in this case, in which case you could almost think that this is just reflective of their, 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 their common religion, um, or whether they were an array of, of, of religions. Um, I'm not sure the record says anything one way or the other about that. Yeah, and, and I was really making a different point, though, Marty, which is, you know, there, there are also are a number of crosses, not highlighted in my amicus brief, uh, <laughs> that are just, you know, have nothing to do with war memorials and stuff like that. And those are the ones I think are, 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 are you know, are, Much are more, more vulnerable. Re religiously to yeah. directed, yeah, I, exactly. one might say. And, uh, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's my only point. Oh, that's, you did some genealogical research. Okay. Good. But there is this 11th Circuit case where the 11th Circuit panel said, you've got to take down this cross in Pensacola. We hate the idea. The Supreme Court needs to do something about it. But we're bound by, you know, our... So do they wait to do it all at one time? Or is it easier to take this Maryland case and then hold off on the one that would be harder since I actually used to go to Easter sunrise services at that cross and that's a public park. So and and I think though I, I haven't studied it, but I think that was why it was constructed. I think it was constructed so they could do Easter services in the park. That's a tougher case. <laughs> I, I, we, we should mention that the plaintiffs here are saying, we don't care what the remedy is. And there's th at least three options, right? One is you take it down, the other is you destroy it. And the third, and the thing that's sort of interesting about this case is get rid of the arms, the horizontal part of the cross, so that it's a, more of an obelisk or phallic symbol or whatever, what have you. Um, and if you really think this is secular rather than religious, you won't have any problem with that, right? It won't be because most of the objections to getting rid of the arms are that would be denigrating religion. Well, you just said it wasn't predominantly religious. So what's the problem with changing a cross into an obelisk unless, you, unless this is really predominantly religious? So I, I, to answer your question, I think they'll grant this and hold the other one and if it comes, but other outcomes are possible. Yeah. So I just want to um, final... Uh, mention just the cases that are bubbling up and that if anybody has any questions on them or anybody wants to say anything. Uh, we have um, really the blockbusters are all in the lower courts right now. So we have the DACA case. Um, we have the ACA case or Obamacare case. The Emoluments Clause case. The challenge to Mueller's appointment. Sanctuary cities. The citizenship question. The Catholic Church and adoption and political gerrymandering in North Carolina. So um, I don't think any of those are good. Well, it's possible one or more might make it, but I'm not sure any will. But anybody who has any comments on That's to get you to come next year. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think that the uh, Arlene Flowers will be back in 
anybody? My personal view is I don't think there's much of a stomach on the court for for resolving the, the compelled speech question in those cases. I agree with Irv that the one that they had the two or three justices denying, dissenting from denial of a stay a few weeks ago about Philadelphia's contracts with the Catholic Charities on adoption or on placement of, um, of foster kids, I guess, is more likely to be a vehicle when the, when that trial is over and when that's said and done. I, I don't think, I think the oral argument and the opinions in Masterpiece sufficiently scared them away from the compelled speech questions in that. In Anybody else on that? Any other questions about any of the other cases or any comments on the other cases I brought up? I guess I just have one brief comment. I'd be shocked if we got through the whole term without the DACA case getting to the Supreme Court. Um, I should say, you know, I've been working on the California case. There's a Ninth Circuit case that's teed up and arguments happened. We're waiting for a decision. As you probably know, there's the Fifth Circuit case, which was the affirmative um, states trying to bring it to say that there can't be any DACA. There's a case that just got to the D.C. Circuit, and then there's a, a Second Circuit case. And so, you know, the Ninth Circuit case, the, the government has tried to take to the Supreme Court twice. They didn't like something that the district court was doing on the administrative record, and they filed a petition for mandamus, which was surprising. The Supreme Court said no to that, which was great. But then after we got a good ruling from the district court, they filed a petition for cert before judgment, and were like, don't wait for the Ninth Circuit. Don't give them a chance. Just take the issue now. I thought there was a good chance that the Supreme Court was going to take it then, but fortunately for our clients, they didn't. But the the Supreme Court said to the Ninth Circuit, like, we're not taking it now, but decide it, you know, as, as quickly as you can, essentially. And the Ninth Circuit's had that case pending since June. You know, I'd be surprised if there weren't a decision soon, and I'd be surprised if the government didn't seek to get it teed up for cert on an expedited basis, especially since that's what they've already done once before. Anybody else on any of the cases or any questions? Yeah. So I think there's two questions you have uh, buried within there. And the first is whether the excessive fines clause applies to the states. And I think an originalist, and Paul would know better than me, uh, since he argued a related case. But the originalists would use the privileges and immunities clause um, to say that, uh, rather than the due process clause, to say that the excessive fine clause applies to the states. As for your other um, question about whether as an original matter property involved in an offense was ever thought to be an excessive fine, I once argued to the Supreme Court that the answer to that question was no and, and lost. So I think it's water under the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and, and just on the, you know, on the incorporation, you know, question, you, you know, there's some issues that you think you're sort of done with, and you sort of thought that kind of, you know, the McDonald against the city of Chicago was the last incorporation case. Um, but, you know, the incorporation doctrine's kicking around in the Gamble case, because that's one of the arguments about what's changed in the law since the court first laid down the separate sovereigns doctrine. And, you, you know, you have that here. I, I, I do think Irv's right that, you know, I think the originalists kind of perspective on incorporation, at least to something like the excessive fines clause, might be, you know, right idea, wrong clause of the 14th Amendment. And, you know, and I think then, you know, originalists have two different reactions to that. Justice Thomas would then say, so that's what we should do. And, you know, even sort of, you know, Justice Scalia, and I think most of the other conservative justices would say, yeah, well, fine, you know, that's probably the right answer as a perfectly <clears throat> original matter. But since we've been doing it under the due process clause for, you know, low this half century, uh, let's just sort of stick with that. And there's no reason to revisit all of that. But I, you know, I, I think those are the two paths, one of which will appeal to one or the other of some of the more conservative justices. Paul, uh, you know I, that's that's one where you know I'm I'm involved in it, and I think Irv may not be right in the sense that I think that one you know the timing of that could be such that it gets up there this term and could be argued in April. I, I also think, and I, I can't resist saying it, is that you know I think the you know both masterpiece and 
partisan gerrymandering, the kind of punts from last term, you know, they, they too suggest to me that the liberal justices didn't know that Justice Kennedy was going to leave because, you know, I, they only had so much control, but I would have thought that they would have had a lot more incentive to push for a more definitive resolution in those cases if they knew that that was their last term uh, with, with Justice Kennedy. So they suggest to me that even late into the term, um, the more liberal justices didn't, didn't know that Justice Kennedy was, was going to take off. And I think in particular, you know, Justice Kagan's opinion that says, oh, hey, the standing thing is really easily fixed, so you can be back here very soon, um, you know, makes a lot more sense when you, when you think you're going to be back here in front of Justice Kennedy. Um, uh, did, you have, did you have a question? Uh, I, I just had one quick thing on. Wait, well, did we get a Paul? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he had, yeah. no, no. I, I, I think that's. I, you know, I think it will get back up here this term, and you know, we'll. You know, it, obviously, all eyes were on Justice Kennedy in that case, and now all eyes are going to be elsewhere. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll obviously see how that ends up turning out. But I think it's, uh, it's going to be a different argument and a different dynamic. You know, one, one thing I think the fact that that is maybe the one of these cases that maybe has the best chance of getting up there this term points out, and it's a point, you know, I've made here before, but, you know, one of the things that is kind of distinct about gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering in particular is this fact that it comes up on the appellate docket, not on the certiorari docket. So, you know, the, I, I don't have much doubt if this was coming up as a cert petition that the Chief Justice might want to sort of kick this can down the road a little bit on the thought that, Look, you know, we've provided a little bit of guidance with this standing holding, and, and it really wasn't with the idea that we'd be back here next term on the merits. Um, but I think with the appellate docket, it just becomes very hard for for these for the court to avoid these cases, and then that makes it, I think, that much more difficult for the court to come up with an administrable test, because there's lots of areas in the law where the court throws out some relatively vague standard and then it's the lower court's problem for half a decade and then the court can just let them sort it out and then when they come up and tee up a nice clean issue for the Supreme Court they can jump back in but if they come up with a difficult to administer standard they're going to be the ones administering it on a year after year basis and you know I think the Chief Justice had one of the most revealing soliloquies, and he usually asks questions, doesn't give soliloquies, but he really did have this fascinating soliloquy in Gill about the problem of these cases coming back term after term. So no accident that it's probably going to be back up there this next term. Anything else from anyone? Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. I haven't seen that report. Have you reported it? Okay. <laughs>